Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for attending today's webinar, The State of Trade, What is a Worker-Centric Trade Policy? Um, before we begin, let me cover a few procedural points. At the end of the session, we'll hold a Q&A uh, as time allows. You can ask your questions through a Q&A function on the right of your screen. Your questions will only be visible to you and to the Flexport team. We'll share a copy of the slide deck at the end of the presentation. And now, to make the lawyers happy, um, our next slide, there we go. Um, please keep in mind that all information provided in this session is based on the situation at this current time and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. We always recommend reaching out to a Flexport expert to discuss your particular situation. All right, um, identities. I'm Phil Levy, I'm Chief Economist at Flexport, and we are very lucky to have an excellent return guest and an old friend with me today, to help solve a puzzle. I'll get to the nature of the puzzle first, but first the guest. Um, it's Scott Linscombe. He is Director General at Cato, Director of General Economics at Cato's Herbert Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies and is a senior visiting lecturer at Duke University Law School, where he teaches a course on international trade law. He previously taught international trade policy as a visiting lecturer at Duke. And prior to joining Cato, Scott spent two decades practicing international law at White and Case LLP where he litigated national and multilateral trade disputes and advised multinational corporations on how to handle global trade rules and national regulations. Scott, welcome back to State of Trade. Oh, great to be here again, Phil. <laughs> All right, we're gonna pick your brain in a second. What we're gonna be talking about today is the relationship between international trade and the well-being of workers. Um, seems like a bit of an academic topic, but we're gonna to try to persuade you otherwise. Um, it's this has taken on particular importance in the Biden administration. If there's a single phrase that the administration has used to set its trade policy apart from that of its predecessors, I think you could argue that would be worker-centric, that it's a, it's a common refrain, it's what they, how they define themselves. So the puzzle that Scott's gonna help me with is figuring out just what this means. And here's how we plan to go about it. We're gonna talk for a bit about what trade has done for or to workers, kind of depends which side of the argument you're on, which one of those you think. Um, but even before, we, you know, what's the lead up to the Biden administration? What, how do we sort of set the scene for this? Then we're gonna talk about what, as best we can make, and we'll look at their own words, what the Biden administration means when they say that they're pursuing a worker-centric trade policy. That's gonna be sort of philosophically, what are they getting at? And then we're gonna ask, what are the practical implications? What does that have to say about what, tariffs might look like, what regulations might look like, um, with whom the U.S. might cut deals. So th those are going to be the practical implications that we'll look at. And then finally, where does that actually lead us? What does that mean for your business? How is the world going to react to this? Does this mean that we won't have deals, does this mean that we're going to have different kinds of deals? Um, trade tensions will continue. So we'll deal with all of that. And then, as I said, time permitting, we'll get to Q&A. All right. Um, as is our tradition here, we want to start out by, by finding where you all are, the, what, what you think about these things. So we're going to start with a poll. Um, you'll find the polls over on the right, and we have one up. So just to get everybody warmed up, we're going to ask, in general, what has trade openness meant for workers? And we give you a bunch of possibilities here. Um, I've done my best to span the spectrum, and hopefully you'll find something in there to your liking. But Okay, possibilities. It has helped them as consumers, but it's hurt their earnings. Two, it depends on the sector. It may have helped some, but it hurt manufacturing. Three, trade has made workers better off. Four, it has meant a race to the bottom in labor standards. Or five, workers' well-being has more to do with things like productivity than with trade. All right, um, we're getting a few votes in, but take your pick. Um, there are wrong answers, but we won't hold them to you, hold you to it. We won't link you to those wrong answers. I'm just kidding. Um, but we, we really want to find out where people are thinking. Um, so far, people are heavily weighing in on, it depends on the sector. It might have helped some of them, but it hurt manufacturing. Thank goodness I have those manufacturing slides, you know, lined up. This would be really embarrassing if they had not had nothing to do with manufacturing whatsoever. Um, although it's receding. All right. So that looks like that's our majority. We thank you everyone for voting. It's great to, to sort of find out where you are. We're, we're getting actually 20, our number two here, God, this is gonna warm your heart, probably. The workers' well-being has more to do with things like productivity than with trade. Um, nice from an economist standpoint as well. 
Um, but we also then, I think right behind that is it's helped them as consumers, but hurt their earnings. Which I think actually is a, you know, an oft expressed point of view and to one that's very worth considering here. All right, let's move on. Thank you all for voting. We'll have a couple more polls coming up in a bit. Um, but let's, let's get to our first section and we're going to talk about what has trade opening done for our two workers. One of the points I want to make is that this is not a new topic. This is something that people have worried about for a long time. Um, you know, and I'll give you some examples of that in a second. But I wanted to start us with a bit of historical perspective. And in particular, um, having you know, correctly forecasted that some of you might have thought manufacturing had something to do with this, that I want to look at manufacturing. Because often that is the complaint, is that we, we opened trade agreements. It killed the manufacturing sector. And if you wanted a grim uh, picture, this is probably the grim picture that you wanted. Uh, this one that we have up here now, because with this, and I'm going to I'll warn you, there are a couple of ways of showing how manufacturing has done, and, the, and future slides are not going to be quite as grim. But if you want to tell the, the, the grim story, you go back to right around the time of the Second World War, Second World War, the, you know, the decade after, and what you see is that more than 30% of the workforce is in the manufacturing sector. And those were often thought of as very good jobs. They were often jobs that um, did not require a lot of advanced training and were seen as, as bringing a good middle class lifestyle. Cut to the present, and actually forget the present, but you know, let's just even go back you know, about 15 years. By the time we get to the global financial crisis, that's that sort of grayish bar around 2008, 2009, um, we're now down below 10% of the population. So that's a really dramatic change that we're going from over 30% of the workforce to under 10% of the workforce in manufacturing. And I think that's often a source of the sentiment that things have gone wrong, paradise lost, you know, we, 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 didn't, we don't have what we used to have. Before we move on from this, let, let me note a few things. One thing to note is that this actually levels off over about the last 15 years. Um, and it was, due to the global financial crisis. It wasn't due to you know, China tariffs because this predates. In fact, that's the key point I want to make on this one is let's just take a moment to look at timing on all of this and see how the timing of things work. Because frequently we, there is this linkage between trade deals, NAFTA is one that springs to mind, and the demise of, if not the American worker, the, the manufacturing employee. So where is NAFTA on? Well, NAFTA is 1994, 1995. Um, and the odd thing is, if you, you can stare at this graph for a very long time, and I have, it's hard to even see a twitch, you know, in the mid-90s that way. That you, we're well into the progression of, of what's happened with all of this. And, you know, and not only was that mid-90s period NAFTA, but that was also the World Trade Organization. And note, by the way, if you said, well, okay, the real thing, it was China joining the WTO. That's what it was. All right, that's 2001. So we're even farther, you know, by this time, we're at, you know, 15%, 13%. We've really come most of the way down. So it's hard to set the timing with these things. But I'm gonna go to make some more points, but while I've got this one up, Thoughts on the, the timing of all of this, the, you know, what, yeah. what's happened to manufacturing employees? I'm going to be about to show output and productivity in a second. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would add a, a couple of things. Uh, first, like you note, uh, this is a slow and steady decline dating back to the 19, uh, late 1940s, early 50s. Um, and that, I think, is one of the reasons why the trade destroyed manufacturing jobs narrative uh, rings, rings hollow. When you back it out, um, and for first, let's acknowledge Trade is competition. Competition is inevitably going to cause dislocations and disruptions, right? Whether it comes from South Carolina or Japan, uh, there's going to be uh, some disruptions there. But in the big, broad case, uh, it's difficult when you look at these data to, to pinpoint the time when trade started doing all of this instead of other big things like productivity, changing consumer taste. That's one we don't talk about a lot. Um, as countries get richer, we tend to consume more services. Uh, and because you, you think about it, you can only buy 
one washing machine, right? Uh, you're, but you can buy a, a, a movie ticket once a week. So uh, it, that composition of consumer uh, of consumption also helps to explain uh, this as well. Uh, you know, you put it all together and it's this soup, right? And it's very difficult to pick which one is doing all the driving. But generally, it's pretty difficult when you look at this long-term trend to say, aha, trade is the big job killer here. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second is that when you look at these figures uh, from a nominal basis, right, so just the number, uh, the declines also started long before our hyper-globalization period of the 90s, right? You know, 1979 is when just the number of manufacturing jobs in the United States peaked. Um, when you look at other things like male labor force participation, uh, that actually started dropping again in the late 70s and 80s, uh, again, before trade was really a big a big part of, of the U.S. economy, before NAFTA, the WTO, China shock, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, in fact, uh, you know, since you have the hurt their earnings in there, it's important to note that most of the middle class wage stagnation you hear about also um, occurred before this hyper-globalization period. In fact, since about the 19, late, early 1990s, uh, wages have, in, median wages for American workers have actually increased pretty substantially in inflation-adjusted terms by about you know, 40 to 50%, which is pretty huge over you know, a 30-year period. You know, that means purchasing power every year is you know, getting just a little bit better. So uh, again, this is one of those reasons why having a broader perspective about trade and jobs is so important, that uh, certainly uh, China and uh, NAFTA and other things can be responsible for individual jobs by individual workers, but when you pull it all out, uh, the story is far more complicated. Yeah, you made a bunch of good points in there, and, and two that I'm particularly happy that you pointed out. This is showing share, so you, you're right, the actual maximization of number of jobs can be quite different, and this is not talking about earnings, and earnings is a different thing. And a different. Yeah. Let's go on to the next slide, because what we'll show is actually proving a point that, that Scott already raised, which is, um, you'll note this one mostly goes up, not down. This is you know, the, the sectoral output in manufacturing. Um, so manufacturing sector employment for all employed persons. And what you see is it goes up and down. We're, certainly we have these sort of vertical stripes where we have recessions. You generally see manufacturing output go down in times of recessions, cyclical business. Um, but that said, you know, with, this is indexed. Um, we are producing, and this, this does not go back quite as far. Note that this back, graph only goes back to 1987, um, that we're producing substantially more manufacturers than we were in 1987. Um, and we sort of maintained at a fairly high level. So this is not really the demise of the sector. You put this one together with the last one. If you go to the next graph and what you will see, wait for it. There you go. Productivity rising. Um, that, you know, if you're looking at output per worker, that this is, again, now we're, we're constrained because of the shorter time period of the last graph, but we start around 1987. And again, over that time period, what you see is with 2012 as 100, we were down around 42 in 1987. That's not, you know, too many decades ago or earlier. And over a fairly short time span, we saw a huge increase in productivity, lots more output per job. Um, you know, one can argue, and I think, Scott, you have in print, that this has to do with things like technology, and it might have to do with also the nature of the job. Yeah. Um, you, you touched on that. Scott's writing regularly. You should read him, uh, The Dispatch and, and elsewhere. Um, but, but maybe you could say a word about the role that, that you see technology playing in this and, and the nature of manufacturing. The earlier graph kind of treated this as like a manufacturing job is a manufacturing. Yeah. Is that right? Is the manufacturing job of today the same as it was of 1955? Well, you teed it up and we all know the answer. I think uh, the answer is no, of course, right? You know, the... the uh, nostalgic view of American manufacturing as, uh, you know, male middle-aged breadwinner on an assembly line uh, stamping a car door or whatever, uh, you know, from all those great movies in, in the 1980s, you know, all the right moves and others, uh, that's basically a uh, goal. You know, there are certainly, there's some low-skill uh, manufacturing jobs remaining, but the manufacturing jobs of tomorrow are much more middle-skill, gray-collar jobs in, 
involve uh, you know more advanced degrees and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think on the productivity point, one of my favorite statistics that hits home how important productivity is in these charts is, so back around 1980, it took 10 man hours, give or take, to produce a ton of steel. Uh, today, it takes about one and a half man hours to produce a ton of steel. So in other words, the US steel industry is today producing the same amount of steel with uh, one fifth the amount of workers, a little, little actually less than that. Um, and in this chart, that's also really important is if, if we were to go back to Phil's first chart, you would note manufacturing jobs on a, a worker on a nominal basis or as a share of the workforce have actually, well, they've increased a bit in the last few years, defying uh, what people projected, say, a decade ago. And then you can see that they, as a share of the economy, they've kind of flattened off, that long decline is top. Well, that just so happened to coincide with uh, the flattening of manufacturing productivity, which again, I think is a, a good indication that a big part of the manufacturing job story is productivity issues. And by productivity, I think it's really important to note, we don't just mean robots right? Everybody thinks, ah, it's all about automation. It's not just about automation. Uh, productivity can be more simpler things like just adopting computers for manufacturing process, new uh, uh, production process technology, um, new, uh, you know, other types of uh, simple changes to business models that don't actually involve, you know, again, robots and stuff. And uh, throughout this period, again, wages have increased along with productivity. Uh, in in the manufacturing sector. Yeah, no, all good points. All right, it's kind of time for us to get to uh, trade policy, where, where our hearts really lie. So let's let's go to the next slide, um, and we're going to move on to the Biden administration in a second. But I first thought we'd note that um, this has been on the agenda for a long time. Thinking about these things, I think you and I we were talking about this before we started. This dates back to me as a young assistant professor and you pulling college pranks. Um, but this was, uh, you know, this is 1996. This was the, you know, the, the essentially newborn World Trade Organization um, turning very quickly. And there was a pressure for a number of issues. And one of the big ones was labor. That this was not an entire, this was not a purely U.S. issue. That one of the questions we can ask is when we say we care about workers, which workers? You know, we've been talking about manufacturing workers. There's other workers, of course, in the United States. And there's workers around the world. So what are we talking about? And there was a push to get this on the agenda, you know, over a quarter century ago um, to talk about these things. And it was a Singapore consensus. Um, you know, all WTO member governments are committed to a narrower set of internationally recognized core standards. So trying to define what you should do for workers. Um, freedom of association, no forced labor, no child labor, no discrimination at work, including gender discrimination. And then, and this is, I'm, took this from the very helpful, uh, World Trade Organization website that we that we link to on here, but they pose a number of questions, which are good questions, I think. You know, if a country has lower standards for labor rights, does that give it an unfair advantage? Would this, you know, force all countries to lower their standards or race to the bottom? Um, we didn't have a lot of voters go for that in our poll, but, you know, should WTO rules explicitly allow governments to take trade action as a means of putting pressure on other countries to comply? Or, and is the WTO the right place to think about this? So, we, you and I have just been talking about sort of broad economic forces, productivity, per, you talked about consumer preferences, wanting to go to services, things that were kind of driving this. This is now getting to the policy realm. But to the extent that one can sort of either do domestic regulation or international regulation to govern these things. You dealt with WTO and international litigation things. What, what was the role of, of thinking about labor in all? Well, in the so in in the in the legal context, uh, there was not much of a role for labor issues because the WTO agreements. So because there's an economic issue and a legal issue, and the economic issue of displacement caused by trade is dates way back, as you know, uh, long before the WTO started in 1995, right? I mean, you know, trade adjustment assistance is an old program dating back, I think, to the Kennedy round, right? So, which is a, a program the United States has to help workers uh, displaced by, by trade competition. Um, 
But the WTO agreements generally did not create enforceable labor uh, provisions. So in other words, you couldn't bring a WTO dispute because uh, of somebody's labor rights. Now, there are exceptions to that. The WTO has clear exceptions. Um, so you're allowed to impose protectionism um, on the basis of things like uh, forced labor, slave labor, that type of stuff. So there is some consideration, but in this general- coming from, this is coming from the core labor standards? Uh, no, so it would, it would, well, you mean the, the, what forced labor is defined as? No, I'm talking about sort of what, how this works sure. into the WTO. Are these separate right. WTO? So, no, so deviating, deviating from core labor standards alone, there's no enforceable WTO commitment in that regard. Uh, it has instead been developed in uh, bilateral and regional trade agreement um, that uh, you saw going back now a couple, now it's almost two decades, that trade agreements uh, started including enforceable labor provisions. The, the basic one was that once you signed a trade agreement with another country, you couldn't then uh, backslide. You couldn't then lower your labor protection. So as long as you kind of maintained the same ones you, you joined the agreement with, you, you were generally okay. But that's now evolved. Um, now there's, there are more rules and more labor regulations. You know, the big one being USMCA, the NAFTA replacement, has quite onerous uh, labor rules and regulations and allows the United States to cut off trade with Mexico where uh, imports are originating in a factory that has been found to uh, you know, have some sort of major labor problem, you know, not allow unionization, not have certain wage rates in the case of, um, of autos. So that's a, big, that's a big change. But to your main point, going back, uh, you know, labor has always been, not always, but a long, long time, labor has been an issue in, in trade agreements but only more recently has become something we, we litigate. Okay, right. Well, that's actually helpful to sort of get, I, I put this WTO thing there, sort of, but how this has evolved and how it has been a subject of policy, it, it's not a novelty to think about this in, yeah. in some of the trade context. And, and, and I, would just, I would just add one quick thing, and that is that I think one of the reasons why labor rights weren't uh, enforceable, you know, like we think about with USMCA or whatever, is because there's a big debate, uh, as you said, in how to address about whether trade really is uh, this this race to the bottom, that it actually undermines labor standards. You know, the free market perspective, which is where I'm, where I am, is that generally trade makes nations richer, and as nations get richer, they tend to have higher labor and environmental standards. So the last thing you want to do is cut off trade with a country like Bangladesh, for example, even though we think some of the labor problems in Bangladesh are quite serious, because if you make Bangladesh poorer, then actually labor standards are going to get worse. And I bring up Bangladesh because Bangladesh is actually a pretty big success story in terms of now having a level of economic development that above India. And a big part of that has been uh, – its trade and its exports of you know textiles and apparel. So it's a very good point. I think a lot of the debate here centers around whether you think that the conditions for workers, including their their compensation, do these come from economic forces or do they come from regulation? Yeah. And the if you think they come from regulation, then your concern is well, you know. People will have dueling minimum wages, and everybody will try to lower the minimum wage to get right exactly. below the other person. Um, if you think they come from economic forces, you're less concerned about that. Um, yeah, and in fact, in fact, mo a lot of development economists, uh, development economists, would say the worst thing you can do is cut off trade with the developing nation because of uh, labor issues. Uh, and again, that goes back to the fact that that, because trade will help them develop and move up the ladder. But the only enforcement mechanism in a trade agreement is what? Cutting off trade. So that's, I think, a big reason why there was a long time, for a long time, there was a, a pretty significant reluctance to, to make uh, labor issues enforceable beyond, again, slave labor and stuff like that. Okay, cool. I think we are now fully primed to take on the Biden administration and, and what they're saying. But the one thing we need to do is we need to find out where, where, our, uh, where our listeners and attendees are. So we're going to field another poll. Uh, 
We're going to ask them what they think. And the question we're posing is, what would you consider the most desirable component of a worker-centric trade policy? Obviously, we haven't yet defined a worker-centric trade policy. That's what we're going to talk about. So here's where you have to use your imagination. What do you want it to be? What would you want it to be? We've just given you a little bit of background. But would it be strong labor standards and new trade agreements? Would it be strong enforcement of existing trade agreements? Would it just be higher tariffs or lower quotas to limit trade on the premise that trade itself does this? Would it be a different policy towards China? Or would it be something which I think Scott was already espousing? Trade liberalization helps workers, lower barriers. See, we're thinking of you there, Scott. Um, right. So the, uh, but actually in most of the other ones, I'll, I'll, I didn't just make these up. You know, this is looking at a number of statements that the administration has made about things that they plan to do. We'll talk about that in just a second. But um, thank you for voting. We've got uh, some, either plurality or sometimes dodging up into a majority saying it's, it's strong labor standards in new agreements. Um, although our, our, the free traders are rallying uh, with 30% uh, with or so saying trade liberalization helps workers and lowers barriers. And, um, th but then in an ever popular uh, coming in third, I think at the moment it changes as I, as I speak, but strong enforcement of existing trade agreements. That one's always very popular in Washington um, where, where, where Scott is sitting, is sitting and we can talk about what that means. But it looks like the, the, the plurality went for strong labor standards in new trade agreements. Yeah. Good. Thank you all for that. I think all of these, well, you know, you guys actually are representing the popular view. Almost no one says we need higher tariffs or lower quotas to do this. You just don't lower the, the, the tariffs that you have or you leave the other things in place. You actually have seen tighter quotas, you know, coming in on things like the, the Section 232 stuff. But all right, very helpful to know where you are. Let's start talking about where the Biden administration is. Um, we, we've deferred this, but they, they've trumpeted this as the defining different thing, you know, what is a worker-centric trade policy? So um, what we have done to try to figure out what this means on the next slide, we asked Catherine Tai. No, we didn't ask her, actually. It was the Senate Finance Committee that asked her what this meant. And so th this is some of what she said in terms of what this means. What do they mean by a worker-centric trade policy? I would note it, it is perhaps telling that this is a couple of, you know, this, this is well over a year into the Biden administration that one is still asking, what does this phrase mean? But she defines this as, President Biden believes trade can be a force for good that grows the middle class and addresses inequality if we get the rules right. To achieve those goals, trade must be grounded in fair competition and workers should not have to compete against artificially low wages or unsafe working conditions. That seems to be pushing towards the labor standards, but we don't have to infer. Here's what they say for policy implications, that the agenda begins with a commitment to putting workers at the center of our trade policy. That doesn't necessarily mean anything yet, but we'll get there. When we defend the rights of workers, both at home and abroad, labor standards go up, workplaces are safer, and we drive a race to the top. This commitment is evident both in our enforcement of existing agreements like the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, as well as our efforts to put workers at the center of our discussions at multilateral fora like the OECD, WTO, ASEAN, and APEC. So worker-centric means workers are at the center. Um, what else do you take from this, Scott? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to take from it is, is to note that Catherine Tai was one of the primary authors of those labor enforcement provisions in the USMCA that I mentioned. So it is utterly unsurprising that she'd be a fan of them. Um, the second thing I think that's important to note in here, and the word that really sets off my my spidey senses, is artificially low wages, right? That what does that really mean? And we have no good answer about artificially low rate wages in our trade agreements and in our, you know, uh, in, in our economics. And I mean, in, in, in fact, as I was noting, I mean, uh, a core part of trade is uh, trade among nations with different levels of economic development. In fact, that's some of the benefits of, you know, this great comparative advantage, you know, lower wage, lower skill uh, countries focus on their, the things that they can do comparatively well. We focus on the higher end stuff and we're all better off. And we, then we sing Kumbaya, right? So um, that I think is another issue is when we start having political actors defining what's an artificially low wage, 
uh, you end up with some issues. Uh, and I think I would note, you know, I mentioned those enforcement provisions. Well, labor, U.S. labor unions love these enforcement provisions because U.S. labor unions tend to be generally protectionists. They tend to not like labor uh, competition uh, from, from imports. So when you start injecting politics into these decisions, I think you run into some, 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 uh, some big issues with uh, things that are supposedly pro-labor really just being uh, a facade for just basic economic protectionism. Um, the, the last thing I would note uh, is that to the extent we, uh, so, so actually let me go back. Uh, so I think that, that these statements have a bit of a definitional problem. What are we really talking about? But I think they also have a, a problem both in the direction and in the magnitude, right? So we already talked about the direction. Uh, this is a view that trade, if left unregulated by Catherine Tai and Washington, will, will be a, a lead a race to the bottom. Right. So directionally, uh, I think there, there's a big argument to say that's not correct, that expanding trade tends to lift boats in the long term, of course. But the other thing is the there's a magnitude issue, right? So even if we grant that USMCA labor provisions are wonderful, that these new cases that USTR is bringing against a couple of Mexican factories are an amazing thing for worker for workers in Mexico and the United States. The fact is that this is an absolute drop in the bucket in terms of the great forces of globalization and trade. Uh, it is not going to make a, a difference in terms of the U.S. trade balance or uh, even just in kind of aggregate country shares of imports. I mean, these are rounding error type issues. And for that, and thus, I don't think they're going to do anything to actually boost workers' support for trade agreements and trade liberalization generally. There's just not enough there there uh, to make a big difference. So let's, I want to dive in on a few of the, the good points that you made. Um, so first, let's just take that last one. You had mentioned trade adjustment assistance before. Part of the premise of this was that, as you said, dated back to the Kennedy round, part of the premise was, well, people had listened in their international trade economics class, and they, they knew the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, and, you know, trade helps some people and hurts others. That was in a particular Hector-Oline framework, but never mind. And so you were going to, but winners would be able to compensate losers. And so this was the compensation. Um, in a way, this was seen as if you do this, then everybody wins and everybody will support trade agreements. Right. Setting aside the economics, from the politics standpoint, that currency doesn't seem to buy you much of anything anymore. Was it? I mean, no, it, I don't think, and honestly, I don't think it really ever did. It might have bought a few votes in Congress. Because uh, they could use it, uh, people in Congress could use it as an excuse for voting for a trade agreement that they needed some cover to do so. But in the reality, uh, you know, we've had TAA forever. Its efficacy aside, it, studies show it wasn't really very effective. Uh, but its political efficacy, it, it again, it really hasn't changed much of anything in terms of labor union support for trade agreements and trade liberalization, uh, and I think general public opinion on on trade stuff. It just really hasn't moved the needle. So some of our friends in the labor movement would refer to this as sort of death insurance, as in, you know, you kill my jobs, it's all gone, and now you now you give me a little yeah, stuff. Yeah, but I think, though, the, and this gets to the other point, though. Um, in, in my opinion, and, you know, we've written at, on K, at Cato about this a bunch, uh, TAA can actually serve to undermine support for liberalization because it treats trade as something special, something that that doesn't provide direct economic benefits to workers too. And I, I can talk about that all day. Um, but, you know, we don't have adjustment assistance for technology. We don't have robot assistance, robot adjustment assistance. We don't have adjustment assistance when your job in Michigan moves to South Carolina. Um, and so by treating trade as somehow special and unique, it actually, I think, implicitly says that trade is bad for workers, bad for the economy, uh, and thus, you know, we have to uh, subsidize those that are displaced by uh, this disruption. Now, I, the econom economists would say that's that's not right, that 
trade is actually quite beneficial for the U.S. economy as a whole, for the vast majority of workers who, by the way, all work in services, you know, manufacturing, you showed the chart. Um, so if you work in services, you basically get 100% benefit from goods import competition. Um, but also, uh, manufacturing workers benefit in a lot of ways from trade. Uh, most obviously, they benefit from exports, right? Uh, you know, trade agreements don't just lower our barriers, they open up new markets. Um, but they also benefit a lot from imports, and we'll get into that in a second. So, yeah. so I think TAA uh, really undermines all of those economic arguments. And uh, again, there's no proof that it's moved the needle at all on the political side. That's on, that's on TAA. I wanted to take up the two things which actually came in um, right near the top, at or near the top of our poll, which is okay. when people talk about labor standards and new trade agreements. Um, you're a lawyer. You've dealt with these kinds. What would one have in mind? How would you write that into a trade agreement? If you're Catherine Tai, what does it mean to put in, you know, a, you, you said USMCA wasn't yes. advanced in this. What, yeah. what would we look at? What would that mean? Well, so the big advancement in USMCA is that it allows private entities, so non-governmental entities, to bring essentially lawsuits. Um, they essentially petition the U.S. government to investigate specific alleged infractions in, in Mexico and then to threaten to impose tariffs if uh, the factory does not change whatever labor policy is in place. So a big one is uh, the right to organize. So if the factory is not allowing workers to organize, uh, USTR comes in, threatens them with tariffs, and then the factory says, okay, fine, we'll, we'll let them organize. Uh, there are, again, I mentioned before, issues on wages and other uh, labor standards. Now, this again is, uh, is not necessarily uh, a bad thing to the extent that it actually works as intended. The problem, of course, is that it can also be just a blatant excuse for, for protectionism. You know, to the extent that um, entities in the United States see factories in Mexico that are causing significant import competition, well, it's a pretty easy thing to do. You file a, a labor case against them that, that will, of course, mute trade, inject a bunch of uncertainty, and, uh, you know, un and undermine your competitor's competitiveness. So there, there, and of course, it gets all gets tied up in, in litigation. The lawyers do all their things. So um, you know, I think that it sounds great, ah, enforceable, strong labor standards, but it's a lot more uh, complicated. Again, leaving aside the development economics issues about whether we really want protectionism to boost uh, workers' uh, actual well-being. There's a couple things wrapped in there together, and maybe they belong together, but maybe we can separate them out. One is, what are the standards? And the other is the sort of degree of enforcement. And from what you were talking about with the sort of private right of action, or at least of sparking action, that presumably came from a suspicion that governments were going to be reluctant to act so that even something that was on the books, you know, if there was a complaint about right to organize, the government for perhaps diplomatic reasons would choo not, choose not to pursue it, but now somebody could nudge them to. Do you think that most of the push is likely to be more on that front, which is sort of maybe enforcement, making sure that more can be done, or is it actually changing and expanding the nature of things where there are commitments? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more on the former, right? The, I mean, the commitments are generally those, you know, with the ILO, uh, and it's generally ILO yeah, commitments, labor, like a yeah. core, yeah, international labor organization. They're generally a core list of them. The I think the big difference comes in the enforcement mechanism, right? That the and the penalty, you know, um, the penalty is now a complete cessation of imports from the targeted factory. Now, this again is uh, not where. Uh, this is the chilling effect this can have on trade is, is potentially significant. Now, so far, it's been used a decent amount, but not that much. And this goes back to the magnitude issue I, I mentioned. Uh, you know, we are just not talking about major changes that are really moving the needle um, in terms of the economics and trade flows or in terms of public support. So I want to, in a minute, get to how this is actually going to translate into a trade policy. 
for, for the Biden Institute. But before we do, can you talk us through, we got a few slides here. You've made mention before of this is not just consumer goods yeah. that we're talking about. Why don't you talk us through a few of these? Yeah, sure. And, and, and I think this is this gets to one of the oh, so I think this gets to one to the earlier poll a little bit and some of the responses. There is a, a myth in the United States, not just in the United States, but there's a general a prevailing myth that import competition is bad for manufacturing workers. Now, I think maybe this was the case back in the day when you had these big vertically integrated conglomerates making relatively uh, simple products like steel ingots or you know steel or whatever. Um, today, it's just not very much uh, the, 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 the case. Uh, the reality, as you can see in the chart, is that more than half of about of everything we import into the United States is stuff, capital goods and equipment, industrial supplies, auto parts that American manufacturers and their workers use to make other stuff. Uh, other studies show that uh, our biggest exporting companies are also our biggest importing companies. And in fact, there's a pretty direct correlation between imports and exports over, over time. The more we import, the more we export, which of course makes perfect sense that to the extent that American manufacturers can get low cost inputs from abroad and then use those to make globally competitive products, what are they gonna do? They're gonna boost output, they're gonna boost employment and the rest. And we unfortunately had a real world experiment with all of this when President Trump slapped tariffs on steel and aluminum. Uh, this was arguably good for steel workers, uh, but it was arguably, ter not, not arguably, studies show it was terrible for manufacturing workers in the industries that are downstream from steel and aluminum. And those workers, of course, outnumber steel workers by something like 40 to 50 to one. So the steel tariffs actually ended up destroying tens of thousands of American manufacturing jobs and hobbling some of our most competitive domestic manufacturers. Uh, so that's, I think, again, why when you think about trade and manufacturing, we have to consider the composition of our imports and what a lot of our uh, companies here are actually buying and, and making. And then, of course, the last point is to think about foreign investment, right? Uh, the dollars that we spend on imports go overseas. They're not set on fire or buried under mattresses in China or Japan. They're invested back into the U.S. economy some way. That's kind of, an, you know, an iron law of of economics. And so uh, you have a lot of foreign invested companies, uh, you know, Japanese auto manufacturers, all sorts of foreign companies that are located here in the United States that, again, are boosting U.S. jobs, they're doing that through that foreign investment. And also they're buying a lot of imports from abroad as well through their own, you know, supply chains. So, um, you know, leaving aside the services stuff, leaving aside that, um, you know, uh, most workers are in services. Uh, manufacturing workers benefit too. Um, and the last thing I would note is that uh, there was a great study from about a year ago about uh, companies that we call goods traders. So these are firms that are engaged in trade in some way. That could be Amazon or it could be a manufacturer. And the study found that um, since the Great Recession, more than half of all new net jobs created in the United States were at these goods trader firms, even though those firms represented less than 10% of all American companies. So these, these firms, these goods traders firms are giant jobs creators. Um, and they are, uh, you know, they rely on access to exports and imports and all that cool globalization stuff. So an unconventional take on worker centric. All right, let's, yeah. let's move to the next slide because we're gonna have to get to some of the policy things, but um, oh, you yeah. were talking about sort of, you know, certainly uh, you know, our voters didn't say a different policy towards China as much as, as a core thing. There may be a selection bias there, but but uh, Catherine, but USTR Thai certainly did, Ambassador Thai. Right. Um, talk, what, what do we make of this? Yeah, so this is a uh, very, uh, complicated way of saying that while tariffs caused Chinese imports to decline a little bit and thus uh, it decreased the U.S. trade deficit with China, um, they actually caused the uh, trade imports from all these other countries 
to increase. And this, I think, again, gets back to uh, these broad macroeconomic forces that are driving trade flows. You know, we talk about it's a trade agreement this or it's a labor provision that. It's just not. Uh, the reality is that, you know, a lot of trade policy or, or protectionism is like, you know, trying to squeeze a balloon. You squeeze it in one place and another place expands. And that's basically what we see in this chart. Uh, imports from China decreased a little bit, but ones from Vietnam increased and Mexico increased and all these other countries because uh, the underlying macroeconomic factors, the underlying uh, seismic forces in the global economy didn't change at all. And there is, we, we should note, one of the more unfortunate and economically illiterate arguments that's entered into this has been, you know, way back in the, in the you know, dawn of time, there was somebody in the Commerce Department who was forced, uh, you know, upon pain of, you know, torture to say how many jobs are associated with a billion dollars of exports. And then that got applied, you know, exports, imports. And as soon as you do that math, a trade deficit means jobs lost. Right. Um, right. It, it doesn't actually make any sense. It doesn't correlate well with the evidence, but it's but politicians love this because what it meant was if you said I do this, you know, I'm going to have this much new, this many new exports to my new trade agreement. You translate that into what people really want to hear, which is jobs. Yeah, and and it doesn't. And I didn't even mention Phil, and I can't believe it in a Flexport webinar. I didn't mention all of the jobs that are just connected to the day-to-day -day aspects of trade, right? There you Guys, go. Yeah. port, you, all of these <laughs> folks that are there are there are are millions of jobs that right. are uh, that depend on kind of again the free flow of goods across borders all this port activity and truckers on the roads and all that kind of stuff um, and we totally ignore all of those jobs as well which it's amazing we ignore them since they are good blue collar no, working class pandering to the audience all right yeah, next sorry, slide. sorry. <laughs> all right so let's let's turn to babies yeah sure so the last thing about worker-centric policy that I think gets very wrong, and the Biden administration is really big on this right now, is that we need to reshore domestic supplies because that makes us more resilient as an economy, right? That our supply chains got too extended and these multinational corporations and their logistics professionals don't know what the heck they're talking about, and that we have to use tariffs and industrial policy and all these worker-centric things to bring our supply chains home and thus have a more resilient and stronger economy going forward. Well, this chart is actually, uh, I think, a great rebuttal to that argument because we've been Very now, good. yes, I know, we, we, uh, we, the color scheme's a little maybe questionable, but uh, the chart itself shows that more than 98% of all domestic production of baby formula was, or all domestic consumption of baby formula was, was produced in the United States, right? This is dictionary definition of a resilient supply chain, right? Well, look, I think we know where this goes. In fact, there was a big story in the Wall Street Journal today that we're now eight months into the baby formula crisis. Shelves are still empty around the country. Um, and a big reason why is because we have tariffs and non-tariff barriers on imported baby formula. We essentially don't as you can see, allow that. And so the US economy, the US market for baby formula can't adjust when there was a shock, this factory closure in Michigan. Uh, and, and thus we actually are less resilient in the case of baby formula. We are more vulnerable to economic shocks when those shocks are domestic. Uh, when we onshore all of this production. Instead, the, the solution, what, what we argue for, is you need to have a free and open U.S. economy, global economy, to allow for uh, quick changes. You know, we've had supply chain shocks throughout the economy throughout the last couple of years. It turns out that the, the things like baby formula or pickup trucks or uh, other food products that are mainly made domestically, whether due to market forces or protectionism, are the ones that are suffering the longer uh, uh, delays and longer uh, outages. Um, you know, it's the globalized products, um, you know, video game systems and televisions, eh, you know, they might be out for a little bit, uh, but they, they reappear on store shelves far faster. Okay, 
That's a very good point. We're going to move back to the Biden administration because our time is running a little bit short. And we've talked, we just talked about principles. What is one thinking about, you know, what was driving this, the philosophical underpinnings, the historical? Let's get practical for a second. So they said they want to do stuff that's more worker centric, maybe with standards, maybe with enforcement. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I, I'm offering you a menu here of where do we think this is going to play out? So Ambassador Tai specifically mentioned doing something different with China. We talked about enforcement actions. They've got their Indo-Pacific economic framework. There's always the possibility. These have been historical fora for talking about these things, the OECD or the WTO. Where do you see, okay, right. given the principles they have espoused, where do those come into play? What changes about the world because they hold those principles? Right, so first a disclaimer, uh, and very lawyerly. Um, we are about to have a midterm for the Biden administration. Well, no, we're about to have a midterm election, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and historically, administrations' views on trade uh, tend to change depending on uh, the the makeup of Congress. In fact, President Obama went from being kind of a protectionist guy to more of a trade, at least uh, less of a protectionist guy, if not a free trader in some context. Um, after he lost control of Congress because essentially his domestic agenda was kaput. So he went to look for things to do elsewhere and, and trade trade agreements like the TPP were, were something that he could, he could do. So with that disclaimer aside, let's assume that the policy of today is the policy in December uh, in the Biden administration. Um, I think negotiations with China are a non-starter. Um, instead, I think we'd see more enforcement actions, continuation of the China tariffs, despite uh, USTR Thai saying that they failed, despite the economic harms, uh, despite the fact that it doesn't seem to have changed any sort of Chinese behavior. Um, they're just too politically toxic, uh, and uh, there's an election to be won always two years away. Uh, and of course, US relations with China are, are pretty dim right now, particularly after uh, the semiconductor export control move last week. You know, the Biden administration announced some pretty sweeping new sanctions uh, on China's semiconductor industry. So uh, if anything happens there, I think it would be less on the negotiations and talk side and much more on the unilateral action side. Uh, a new Section 301 investigation of say industrial subsidies, something like that. Um, nothing that's a uh, collaborative effort. I, mean, I think things are pretty darn frigid right now between the two countries. Yeah. Um, on important, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, take your pick of these. Pick your um, favorite where you think we might see action, if any, you don't have to commit to action. Well, uh, so I mean, I think the one to really talk about is the new trade agreements, right? So, right. because, so this IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is the Biden administration's um, uh, TPP light, right? And this, I think, reflects a big point in the Biden administration that I don't think is going to change, regardless of who's in Congress, is that the Biden administration, for better or worse, seems to believe that trade agreements are toxic. They are toxic politically uh, with voters, and they are toxic with labor unions, and most importantly, they are toxic with Congress. So traditional trade agreements are out. Instead, what we're going to get is a thing like IPEP, which is nibbling around the edges of trade for better or worse. Better is things like digital trade <clears throat> um, and some other uh, kind of you know bilateral investment discussions and the rest. Um, but worse in the sense that there's no binding liberalization of tariffs, non-tariff barriers. Uh, so it's very much kind of a uh, consultations and a few small things. And I think that's where we're going to continue to see going forward, regardless of, of what happens in Congress. As much as I would love to see the United States rejoin the TPP, which is now the CPTPP, uh, and as much as I think that would be good for the economy, for geopolitics and kind of, you know, this uh, offsetting China's fear of influence in the region, it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Instead, I think, you know, IPEF is going to be our future. Uh, and I think the same IPEF framework would apply to any other country. These kind of deals that don't require congressional action that might, you know, help in a few discrete areas, but aren't going to be what we consider to be classic trade agreements. I want to come back to that IPEF point to conclude in a second, but first, let's, I want to go to the audience one more time. Let's take a third poll and see where they think 
this stuff is all leading. Um, so as, we, as our sort of time wraps up, let me ask all of you, where do you think that we've now defined it a bit, where do you think this push for a worker-centric U.S. trade policy will lead? And here's the options we're giving you. Um, it will significantly improve prospects for workers, especially manufacturing. It's well-meaning, but it's unlikely to have any major impact. It's going to end up as an excuse for maintaining existing trade barriers. I realize that some of these could overlap. You have to pick your favorite. It will increase tensions with trading partners, and it all depends on the execution and on the next election, paneling Scott there. Um, so I um, ask you to weigh in. What's your, what's your best guess of where this is, where this is leading? Um, so far, we've got two answers that are you know, sort of in the lead, um, although next election is sort of coming in there. But uh, in the forefront is well-meaning, but only could have any major impact. Oh, but then coming up is excuse for maintaining existing trade barriers. All right, let me add, let a few more of you vote. I appreciate you voting. Always thankful for your participation here. Um, actually, it's now pre pretty close to a three-way split between well-meaning, no impact, maintain existing trade barriers, and depends on the next election. Scott, as we sort of move toward to wrapping things up, um, I, there's a couple in here that might appeal to you. If I made you vote, what, what would you vote? Uh, well, I think uh, the third, fourth, and fifth, that's the ones I want to vote for. Um, <laughs> I think that they, the administration has clearly used worker-centric to defend the Trump tariffs on steel, aluminum, and uh, Chinese imports. Um, Worker-centric trade policy was also a big part of this big industrial policy push in the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, uh, in the Infrastructure Bill, in the CHIPS Act. This is all very worker-centric industrial policy, which is a type of you know, trade policy. Well, that uh, hits to the point four. The Europeans are furious about a lot of this industrial policy. The Koreans, the Japanese as well. So I think it will increase some tensions. And of course, tensions with China, I don't know, can they get any higher? Let's hope not. Uh, I don't want any shooting to start, right? Uh, and then last, I do think some of it will, again, depend on uh, who's who's in running Congress. You know, where there is a Republican House or Senate, um, where Biden's domestic agenda is stymied and he no longer has to worry about the vote of guys like Sherrod Brown in Ohio, um, there may be an opportunity for actual, uh, a little movement on, on U.S. trade policy. But if uh, I don't think that's anywhere guaranteed because, of course, Republicans have become Trumpier in the last few years and uh, their support for trade. It's not like Obama back in, in 2011, right? It's, uh, it's a different world now. So I, it really, it's hard to say. And one very last quick question before we wrap up. Coming back to the IPEF stuff that you yeah. were talking about, if what you had earlier said was the really big deal is that people have these commitments and you could actually withdraw liberalization right. if if somebody violates one of the commitments. How does that work if you're not actually making liberalization commitments? What are you withdrawing and no. what are you enforcing? Exactly. And it goes back to, you know, Trump committed the same flaw, uh, uh, error when he had this phase one deal with China. If you don't have an, which didn't have a, an enforcement mechanism. Um, if you don't have an enforcement mechanism, uh, trade agreements are, are barely worth the paper they're written on. Um, and IPEF uh, doesn't really have much in the way of an enforcement mechanism. Um, and quite frankly, uh, IPEF is not what the IPEF members, other than the United States, actually want. If you listen to New Zealand and others, uh, they say they want a trade agreement. They want a binding enforceable deal to further integrate the economies, to help them counterbalance China, all those good things. And uh, without that substance, without that, uh, those terms, which do require congressional approval, uh, it's 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 a nice meaning thing that might have some benefits on the margins, but isn't really going to move the needle. All right, thank you very much for that, Scott. For that, for all your insights, we may not have trade liberalization, but at least we have a degree of enlightenment. Um, thank you to all of you for for attending today's session. We are going to email out the slides and the link to this recording tomorrow morning. Um, there will also be a short feedback survey presented when you log off this call. Please take a moment to share your thoughts and feedback with the team so we can continue to curate great content for you. So thank you for attending again and have a great day.